it's a pleasure to join you and give you an update on our work in the last several years. Uh, and in particular, what we've been doing to look at the mechanistic basis of CNS vascular development and disease. And let me begin somewhat unconventionally with uh, the names of the people who did the work. I don't want this to be an afterthought. And in my own lab, there are a number of students, postdoctoral fellows, technicians, and research associates who've worked on this project. I wanna particularly point out uh, Chris Cho and Amir Ratner, Mark Sabah, Phil Smallwood, Yan Shu Wang, Xin Yi, and Yulian Zhu, who were main movers here. And we've had many wonderful collaborators over the years. They're listed down below. And um, just to give us the picture from 30,000 feet, here's uh, our object of interest. It's the human circulatory system, the vasculature. Uh, of course, uh, virtually every tissue in the body is supplied by the vasculature, but the uh, particular tissues that are of interest to us are the brain and retina, the central nervous system. And uh, in particular, we're interested in the way in which canonical wind signaling affects both the development and the function of the CNS vasculature. And here's a very much simplified view of canonical wind signaling. Uh, just uh, by way of review, probably for most of you, uh, the signal is initiated when an extracellular ligand, a wind protein, these are uh, roughly 40,000 molecular weight proteins, binds to its receptor uh, called frizzled, a seven transmembrane protein. And that uh, receptor ligand complex interacts with a co-receptor called LRP5 or LRP6. They're nearly identical single span transmembrane proteins. And this, in this little cartoon, this is the lipid bilayer at the plasma membrane. And this combination of Wnt, frizzled, and LRP uh, leads to a stabilization of beta catenin, a rather unusual mechanism. Uh, beta catenin is a cytoplasmic protein that is normally turned over at a very high rate, and its stabilization leads to its accumulation in the cytoplasm, and then eventually its migration from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, where it and its partners control transcription. Now, the story uh, for us begins uh, with a ligand that is actually not Wnt, it's called norin, uh, but it, as I'll show you in a minute, it behaves very much like a Wnt, and it uses one frizzled, frizzled four, and it signals in retinal vascular development. And uh, this story really began in the early 1960s when Meta Barberg, who was a Danish ophthalmologist, uh, described a disease uh, that she named Nori disease after the original ophthalmologist who saw the very first patients in the 1920s. And here is one pedigree from Warburg's paper. Uh, every square is a male, every circle is a female. I think you can appreciate that this is classic X-linked inheritance. Here's a carrier female. She has several affected sons. She has a daughter who also has an affected son and so on. And uh, Nori disease turns out to be due to mutations in a small secreted protein. It's a far-flung member of the TGF beta superfamily. And the phenotype is congenital blindness. Uh, in fact, the retinas uh, are very much altered. Uh, and we now believe that the result, uh, th that they, that is the result of a severe hypovascularization, a failure of the retinal vasculature to grow and a subsequent uh, scarring and degeneration of the retina. Some years later, uh, a milder retinal hypovascularization disorder, a really family of disorders was described. These are called familial exudative vitreoretinopathy, FEVR or fever for short. And uh, this is what fever looks like through the ophthalmoscope on the right compared to a normal retina on the left. You can appreciate that the uh, blood vessels come out of the optic disc uh, where the optic nerve goes in towards the brain and they cover the surface of the retina. And in the fever retina, uh, many of the blood vessels are present, but there's a central region which is hypovascular. And in this instance, uh, it has retracted from the retina. There's a scar uh, reaction, a scarring reaction, which involves retraction. And there's a very substantial loss of vision for this individual in this uh, zone of retracted retina. Now, uh, where this got, um, these two worlds of uh, fever and neuro disease collided and got very interesting was when we and uh, 
others made knockout mice, in, in particular a Berger's group in Switzerland made the first Norin knockout mouse. And the, the protein uh, name is named Norin, but the gene is named NDP, Nori disease protein. Uh, when that uh, gene was knocked out in mice and when we knocked out frizzled four, uh, we saw nearly identical phenotypes. And this is just our repeat of the Berger Labs knockout for Norin. And, and the phenotype is quite striking. So these are cross sections of the retina. Let's just look at the wild type first. Uh, in blue is DAPI. So we see the three nuclear layers, the photoreceptor layer, the inner nuclear layer, the ganglion cell layer, and in red are the blood vessels. And uh, there are a series of uh, layers also. Uh, there's an outer tier, a middle tier, and then an innermost vitriol tier of blood vessels. And I think you can appreciate that in both the frizzled four knockout and the Nori disease uh, knockout retinas, the vasculature is present. In fact, it's hypertrophied on the vitriol face of the retina. And it has uh, begun to invade the retina, but it has abortively invaded. That is, it has failed to uh, invade at a sufficient distance and to link up in capillaries. These are just dead end balls of cells that we're seeing here uh, in the mutant retinas. Well, this uh, virtual identity in the retinal vascular phenotypes of a putative ligand, a member of the TGF beta superfamily, for which at this time no receptor was known, and a known receptor, frizzled 4, for which the ligand was already known, uh, suggested to us that maybe this receptor actually had a a different ligand, an additional ligand. Uh, that is, it had Norin as a ligand. And that turned out to be the case. This is work of Chung Zhu, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time. And uh, what Chung did was he simply transfected the receptor, the ligand, and one of the co-receptors into a reporter 293 cell line. And we, he saw uh, very impressive canonical wind signaling. This is a luciferase readout. When all three are present, but if you leave out any one of the three, for example, in this case, the ligand is omitted, there's virtually no signaling. And the same is true whether one uses the LRP5 or the LRP6 receptors, or co-receptors, I should say. Now, in addition to uh, mediating cell signaling, uh, Norin also binds with high affinity to frizzled 4. And this was demonstrated uh, by uh, Jen Chi She in my lab uh, in multiple ways. For example, if we produce the frizzled four ligand binding domain, which we called CRD, cysteine rich domain. It's a small domain of about 100 amino acids, as an IgG fusion protein. And as a control, we produce the ligand binding domain of a different frizzled, also as an IgG fusion. We see very specific binding of norin to the frizzled four ligand binding domain. Uh, and the same if we do binding to whole cells expressing the full length receptor. And the affinities are in the low nanomolar range. So um, frizzled 4 uh, seems to be acting as a receptor for Norin, at least in these cell culture and biochemical experiments. But you might be wondering, well, does uh, this really hold up in vivo? And so let me show you one piece of evidence. It's an experiment from Yuli and Zhu uh, that argues strongly in favor of the answer being yes. And let's just focus on the bottom three panels here. These are unfos views of the retinal vasculature. And on the left is a wild type mouse retina, and uh, the vasculature has been color-coded based on its depth within the retina. So blue is most superficial, green is in the middle, and red is deepest. And in the second panel, uh, the middle panel, we see the same retinal flat mount now for a Nori disease knockout retina. And uh, you can see this hypertrophy of vessels on the surface. You see these balls of vasculature that really have not accomplished anything. Uh, they penetrated a little bit in, into the retina, but they haven't formed the vasculature. And now on the right is a flat mount of a mouse retina. It's a, it's a Nori disease knockout retina, but we have uh, genetically engineered these vascular endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels, to express a stabilized form of beta catenin. So that's the CTNNB1 gene. And here's the trick. This is from Mark Takedo's lab in Japan. Turns out that the uh, phosphorylation site on beta catenin that controls its stability, that leads to its degradation, uh, resides, is encoded on a single very tiny exon. That exon happens to be a multiple of three nucleotides. So if you delete it, uh, you get an in-frame deletion and the protein appears to be perfectly fine. It doesn't need this little 
segment of polypeptide, but it's stabilized. It can't be degraded nearly as efficiently as the wild type protein. And so it, it bypasses any defects at the receptor and uh, ligand level and simply stabilizes beta catenin within the cells. And the result is a very nice rescue. So we take this as strong evidence that what's wrong in vivo in a norin knockout mouse and also presumably a norin mutant human is a failure of canonical wind signaling in vascular endothelial cells. Now, let's look at a second uh, chapter in this story because uh, it gets more interesting and more complex. And that is GPR-124 and REC. These are two additional players, two additional proteins, and they are ligand specific co-activators of beta catenin signaling, canonical wind signaling. And they are important in the brain and spinal cord, but they do essentially the same sort of signaling. They contribute to the same sort of signaling. And by way of background, let me just note that uh, uh, our lab showed a number of years ago, uh, Max Tischfield, when he was a postdoc in the lab, that Canonical wind signaling is required in the embryo in the vasculature only in the central nervous system. So what Max did was he knocked out uh, beta catenin with his conditional knockout using a Cree that drives uh, expression in all vascular endothelial cells. And what he saw was a little embryo that's shown on the right. The right is the mutant embryo, the wild type is on the left. What he saw is a little embryo that was uh, normal in size and shape and morphology outside of the CNS seemed perfectly normal. It had somites, it had a heart, it had an aorta and so on. But uh, within the CNS, the vascularization, which you see on the left here in the normal embryo in green, this is the neural tube going down the middle, uh, all these beautiful blood vessels growing into the neural tube uh, were growing abortively, essentially the neural tube equivalent of what we saw in the retina with the neuron knockout mouse. And uh, that would argue that there's something special generally about CNS tissue that requires canonical wind signaling for angiogenesis, for vascular invasion. To this day, we don't know what that is. We don't know what's special about CNS tissue. Now, uh, this initial experiment uh, got more interesting thanks to the work of my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins, Ken Kinsler and Bert Vogelstein in the oncology department shown on the right and their postdoctoral fellow, Brad St. Croix, who when he was a postdoc here, that was 20 years ago, uh, did a very remarkable uh, piece of work. He looked with one of the earliest uh, transcriptome technologies actually invented by the Vogelstein Kinsler lab um, called SAGE, which uh, allowed him to ask in a systematic way whether the vascular endothelial cells in tumors were different in their transcriptomes from the corresponding normal vasculature of non-transformed tissues. And in particular, they looked in the colon and what they saw was something remarkable, which was there is in fact a change in gene expression. It's, it doesn't involve that many genes. It's in the uh, tens to 100 range. And among them were eight genes, eight membrane proteins, uh, encoding eight membrane proteins, which showed dramatic increases in tumor vasculature. And they decided to call these tumor endothelial markers and they numbered them one through eight. And TEM5, tumor endothelial marker five is the one that we're gonna talk about here. It was a known protein, uh, not a protein of known function, but a, a protein that was, uh, that, that was in the database as a sequence. It was called GPR124 and it had seven putative transmembrane segments. So it was um, considered potentially a G-protein coupled receptor, hence the name GPR. And it was 124 of, of these uh, orphan putative receptors in the collection. Well, here's just an example of the in situ hybridization data from the Kinsler Vogelstein lab. Here, for example, is TEM5. Uh, the in situ signal is in red, and this is a colon carcinoma. And you can see it's very nicely expressed in the vasculature that uh, has infiltrated this tissue, but it's essentially not at all expressed in the normal human colon. The same is true shown on the left for TEM1. Now this got even more interesting about uh, 10 years after its discovery, this is now, now we're up to about 2010, when three groups essentially simultaneously showed that knocking out GPR124 in mice led to a defect in CNS angiogenesis and also in uh, blood-brain barrier integrity. 
And let me just show you a little bit of that data. This is now reproduced in our lab. This is the developmental data. If we look at uh, an embryo, this is about day 13, um, and we section through the head, we see lots of blood vessels in the CNS. Let's just look at the cortex on the right. You can see the blood vessels in the cortex at this point, and the second from right is the medial ganglionic eminence. And in a GPA-124 knockout, first there's a lot of bleeding in the CNS. This is secondary to vascular breakdown, but most impressively, there's very little vasculature. So if you look at the cortex, it's essentially avascular. And likewise for the median ganglionic eminence. And there's also a fair bit of cell death occurring. Okay, quite a dramatic phenotype. Now, the, uh, the view in the field at that time was that this was a novel G-protein coupled receptor, and therefore there was a novel G-protein coupled receptor pathway that must play an integral role in CNS vascularization. And that all seemed very exciting. Uh, when we saw this data, we had a somewhat different reaction. We thought uh, this is amazingly similar to the defects one gets with canonical Wnt signaling knockouts. And maybe GPR-124 has something to do with canonical Wnt signaling. So at this point, Yulian Zhu, who was a grad student in the lab, uh, did a very simple experiment. She asked, and I'll, this is the left panel, I'll, I'll take you through this step by step. She asked in the luciferase reporter assay, if you plot on the horizontal axis, the relative luciferase activity that you get when you transfect in uh, any of each of the 19 winds, and there are 19 winds in, in the mammalian genome, and we've tr tested each one of them. Uh, if you, if you uh, test a wind plus GPR-124, plus LRP5, uh, and in some cases you get more or less signaling. Um, and I should add here that these cells, these are modified 293 cells, they actually express at low level, uh, essentially every one of the 10 frizzles encoded in the mammalian genome. So we didn't have to add an additional frizzle uh, for this experiment. And in any case, we weren't sure which one we would add. So it's just as well that they express all 10 at low level, it saved us the trouble. But we see uh, that many of the winds uh, do in fact induce uh, signaling in this reporter assay. And then on the vertical axis is the relative luciferase activity ratio of this experiment in which uh, Wnt, GPR, and LRP are present divided by the level that you get if you omit the GPR-124. You just put in the original uh, empty vector PRK5. So we're looking for the level of stimulation afforded by GPR-124, and we're asking this for each of the 19 winds plus Norin, where there are a whole bunch of the data points down here at the left, which are not labeled, but the ones on the right, many are labeled, uh, all are labeled, I guess. And the striking observation was that uh, for almost all of the winds and for Norin, there's essentially no effect of adding GPR-124, that is the ratio on the vertical axis is very close to one, uh, as shown by this horizontal line. But for two of the winds, wind 7A and wind 7B, there was clearly a stimulation by GPR-124. And the reason this was interesting is because at this point, uh, we knew from Andy McMahon's work and Ben Barris's work that wind 7A and wind 7B uh, are critical for CNS vascularization. They're, they're doing in the brain and at least part of the spinal cord very much what Norin is doing in the retina. And here on the right, we just have a more complete assay. Now we're transfecting in frizzled for the receptor, as well as LRP and a Wnt and GPR-124, and we get a huge stimulation compared to the control of either the empty vector or related uh, orphan GPCR, GPR-125. So this would argue that GPR-124 is somehow and specifically stimulating canonical wind signaling through wind 7A and wind 7B, which made perfect sense given its phenotype of CNS uh, vascular deficiency. Now, uh, without showing you all the gory details, I'll just say that this has gotten more interesting and complex in the years since. It turns out there's yet another protein called REC. It's a, a GPI anchored protein with many domains, which is also involved in promoting wind 7A and wind 7B signaling. And so the, the full complex at the surface of the cell, we now believe is at least these proteins, the co-receptor, LRP, the receptor frizzled, the ligand, WIN7A or WIN7B, and the, what we call co-activators, GPR124 and REC.
And just to give you an idea of how specific this stimulation is, I'll show you data from some, this is not all the winds, we've done them all, but just so they all fit on the slide, I'm showing you just some of them. Um, if we look at, uh, for example, uh, empty vector transfection, GPR-124 transfection, REC transfection, or REC plus GPR in blue, I think you can appreciate that for wind 7A and wind 7B, and this is the work of Chris Cho, a grad student in the lab, there's a very impressive stimulation of signaling when both REC and GPR are present, a much less impressive stimulation when just one or the other is present. But the other winds, uh, and this is true of the ones I'm not showing you as well, are essentially insensitive to REC and GPR-124. And the same specificity is seen in a direct binding assay. So let me just show you, this is an assay that Chris developed. It's a live cell binding assay with a uh, alkaline phosphatase fusion probe. And what we're doing is we're probing live cells with either the N-terminal region of REC, and we've, we've shown that that's the business end of REC as far as wind signaling stimulation is concerned, or we're probing with the N-terminal region of GPR-124. And again, we've shown this is the business end of GPR-124. Now, if we uh, transfect the cells, this is 293 cells with GPR-124 and frizzled 4, and then each of the indicated winds, wind 1 through wind 16 or norin, and then probe those cells with REC, which, which was not transfected into them, so it's the missing piece. We see that the REC probe binds only to cells that were co-transfected with wind 7 a or wind 7 b not with any of the other WINTs or with norin. And likewise, the GPR-124 N-terminal region probe binds only to cells transfected with REC and frizzled 4 and the two appropriate WINTs, 7A and 7B, but none of the other ligands. So this complex we think is assembling in a very specific manner and inducing signaling very specifically uh, by these two WINT uh, ligands. Now, let me just show you a little bit of in vivo data that this um, really is, this canonical wind signaling story really is happening in vivo. The top two rows you've seen before, this the top one's a wild type mouse. The second one is the GPR-124 knockout mouse. And what we've done here is we've asked, what if we just flood the central nervous system with norin, the norin ligand, and, and we have a, a Cree-dependent uh, mouse transgene that will do that. It's called Z-norin. And so here we're showing in, in a wild type background, there isn't much effect in a wild type mouse of having some more extra norin on board. And I should mention here, norin is expressed in the embryo, in the brain and spinal cord. So it's not just in the retina. And we had noticed this and we're supposing that norin was also acting in the brain and spinal cord, but maybe not giving much of a phenotype because of redundancy with this Wnt 7A and 7B system. But now, if we take a GPR-124 knockout, which we presume is defective in the wind 7 a wind 7 b signaling arm, and flood the CNS of that little embryo with norin, and you can compare it to the second row here, which is the, the knockout alone, you can see there's a very nice rescue of the CNS vascularization defect. That is, it doesn't really matter how you activate canonical wind signaling, as long as you do. And in, in, of course, uh, the right place at the right time, in this case, vascular endothelial cells in the embryo. But uh, they will work just fine if they're activated by norin signaling as opposed to Wnt 7 a or Wnt 7 b signaling. Now we've refined this even further. I won't go into all the details, but uh, it turns out we, we've been able to narrow down to just a couple of amino acids, critical residues in REC in this N-terminal domain uh, that are essential for Wnt 7 a signaling in cell culture and when we use CRISPR to knock in a double mutant, it's a, it's a proline and tryptophan, which each get mutated to alanine. And this is just the genomic PCR and sequencing to prove that the mutations are there. We see this very impressive uh, bleeding in the CNS. And uh, we also see a, a spectacular hypovascularization. I should just, let me just go back a second and just say, by, I won't go into all the details, but by Western blotting, the mutant protein is present. It's, so this does not destabilize the protein. The protein is there and whatever else REC does and it has many other domains and it probably does other things, we presume it's able to do all those other things. 
but it just is unable to activate wind signaling with wind 7a and wind 7b. And we do that and compare the wild type at the top here and the mutant down below, we see this uh, very dramatic hypovascularization, all this green and hypo uh, plastic that is it, it failed to proliferate it as much as it should, no surprise since it has no blood vessels, uh, CNS tissue. And here, same thing, and it's, it's very region specific. So this, this is cortex, essentially completely hypovascular, but the, the midbrain and hindbrain are actually pretty well vascularized. And that's because norin is there. So norin is partially redundant with the WINT7A and WINT7B systems, but it is not redundant in the cortex or the medial and lateral ganglionic eminences. Okay, now this um, actually goes some way towards addressing what I would say is a longstanding challenge in WINT uh, biology, WINT biochemistry, and that is how WINTs interact with their frizzle receptors in a specific manner. This is a crystal structure that uh, Chris Garcia's group at Stanford did now about eight years ago. And in pink is, is the WINT, and in blue is the ligand binding domain of a frizzled. And you can see this most remarkable uh, co-crystal structure in which the WINT, the pink part, is holding the uh, ligand binding domain like a, like a hand holding a hot potato with, with one thumb and one finger, but nothing else is touching except uh, a little bit of protein on each side and a lipid here, which is sitting, sitting in a lipid crevice. But most, uh, nearly all of the contact residues, in fact, are highly conserved across different winds and across different frizzles. So the question of ligand receptor specificity, which very clearly exists from in vivo data, was left substantially unanswered by this crystal structure. And we think that uh, accessory proteins like GPR-124 and REC are a large part of the story. They are uh, somehow, uh, maybe for, for other WINTs, there are other accessory proteins, but at least for WINT7A and WINT7B, they are providing much of the specificity. And so just in sum, these are the players now as we know them for uh, canonical wind signaling in vascular uh, endothelial cells in the CNS. And um, these two accessory proteins, GPR 124 and REC, are the players that make this 7A and 7B signaling possible and specific. Now, let me move on to a related topic, and that's the blood brain barrier. I mentioned it very briefly in connection with the original GPR 124 knockout mice. And uh, there's a fascinating uh, story here. Recall that the blood-brain barrier is really uh, a whole cell biological and molecular genetic specialization of vascular endothelial cells in the CNS. Here's a cartoon of a capillary in the CNS. And what these capillaries have that makes them special is they have tight junctions, so there's no intercellular diffusion of small molecules. They lack the transcellular diffusional pathways like fenestry uh, and bulk uh, transcytosis. And so everything that moves from the, um, the, the blood space into the parenchyma of the brain has to do so with specific receptors as shown here for receptor mediated endocytosis or for uh, a transporter here, transporting, for example, glucose or an amino acid, a very expensive system. But almost certainly the reason uh, the system is designed this way is to keep toxins out of the brain. And I should mention that the, the retina being part of the CNS has exactly the same system. So. Uh, this is a whole uh, pattern of gene expression, which has altered the properties of the CNS vasculature. And it's a big deal because uh, blood-brain barrier integrity is compromised in many neurologic disorders. So for example, uh, in stroke, multiple sclerosis, CNS infections, traumatic brain injury, tumors, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, the list goes on and on. There is a decrement in blood-brain barrier integrity and a leakage of serum contents into the brain. It's also important because the BBB excludes drugs that act in the periphery and that would have intolerable side effects if they entered the CNS, for example, blood pressure medication. And conversely, drugs that have to act in the CNS like antidepressants, antipsychotics, anxiolytics, analgesics, and so on, they need to have the right combination of properties to essentially fool the blood-brain barrier and penetrate it. And that's not so easy, easily done. So this is a big deal in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, let me just show you the one really sort of critical result. And that is that 
Canonical wind signaling is not just used for CNS angiogenesis. It is also repurposed later in life, in fact, throughout life, to uh, activate the blood-brain barrier program. So here's just one example uh, showing how this works. And, and I should add that like uh, the developmental case, both the WIN7A and WIN7B systems, that is the system that also uses GPR124 and REC, and the NORIN system uh, are redundant, substantially redundant in maintaining the blood-brain barrier. Both, both those systems, the components are expressed throughout life. And if we look at a wild type, and now we're, we're using a, a little tracer, sulfo NHS biotin, which we have introduced into the vascular system peripherally, and that uh, little tracer is kept out of the brain. You can see the brain parenchyma is blue. This is DAPI staining. It enters the cerebrospinal fluid in the lateral ventricles as shown here left and right, but otherwise it's kept out of the brain. And that's true whether the Nori disease gene is knocked out, in this case, a heterozygote uh, for 124, a conditional over minus, or in this next uh, to the right panel, we have a GPR-124 conditional knockout, which is now eliminated in adulthood with a CRE-ER uh, driver. We have to do it in adulthood, of course, because we need the embryo to develop its vasculature normally. But again, the blood-brain barrier is normal. But if we knock them both out simultaneously, we get massive leakage of this little tracer everywhere within the brain. And the same thing can be seen by immunostaining. So without going into all the details, Cloudin-5 is a tight junction protein. PLVAP is a marker of leaky vasculature. It's a fenestration protein. And uh, in the wild type or any of the brains that have wild type phenotypes with respect to the blood-brain barrier, there's lots of Cloudin-5 and there's no PLVAP. So it's green and not purple. But in the double knockout, the uh, vasculature anatomy hasn't changed, but the gene expression has changed. PLVAP is now expressed. Cloudin-5 is repressed. And that has led, as well as changes in other uh, genes that normally would uh, distinguish blood-brain barrier competent from incompetent, that has led to the loss of barrier function. Now, finally, the last topic, circumventricular organs. And these are regions within the CNS that have highly permeable vasculature. So these are the exceptions that prove the rule. And where are they? Well, they're just in a few uh, very distinct places. They're in places where the contents of the serum need to be as, uh, accessed by neurons. So for example, the area postrema, which is right under the uh, cerebellum, is a small region of CNS tissue, which is sensing toxins within serum, and it makes you vomit. That makes perfect sense, because if you've ingested something that's toxic, as that material is starting to get absorbed into your bloodstream, you have a little time window to vomit up the rest of it and get it out of your stomach. And that's what the area post-treatment treatment does. In fact, it's, it's also, and this is of medical significance, it's the region that's responsible uh, primarily for the nausea that accompanies uh, chemotherapy in cancer patients, because that is essentially a toxin and acts on the area post -trema. The subfornical organ, again, needs access to the serum because this is an organ that assesses the osm osmolarity of serum, the, the sodium content in particular, and determines whether the organism should be thirsty or not. Now, each of these areas has a vasculature which is leaky. So here's uh, the area post -trema. This is a uh, sagittal section, uh, posterior to the left, anterior to the right. Let's just focus on this region and the surrounding green. The, the, this is the same set of markers we saw before. Uh, sorry, it's the same colors we saw before, but the, the green marker is different. This is now the glutamate transporter, GLUT1, which is a, yet another marker of the blood-brain barrier. It's required because glucose can't freely diffuse across a barrier-competent uh, uh, endothelial cell, so you need a specific transporter there, and this is the one that does it. So barrier-competent cells are green, uh, leaky cells are purple, and this is the wild type, and here's the area post has leaky vasculature. And here we've just injected that red tracer, and you can see it lighting up the perivascular uh, region. It's just, it's leaked into the immediate uh, surroundings of the blood vessels. I should just say this very leaky region on the right is the choroid plexus, the, the place where cerebrospinal fluid is produced. So no surprise that that's also leaky. Now, if we play the same trick by stabilizing beta-catenin, 
in all vasculature everywhere, we see an amazing conversion. This is now done in the adult. The area postrema has flipped from leaky to tight. It's now become barrier competent and there's very little leakage. There's, a, there's an occasional cell which has failed to undergo recombination, but except for those cells, the rest of the cells are barrier competent. Here's the same thing with a subfornical organ. I just wanna draw your attention to this protein LEF1, which is one of the co-activators with beta-catenin. It's a partner of beta-catenin, but it is also part of a positive feedback loop. The LEF1 protein itself is a target of canonical Wnt signaling or beta-catenin signaling and is upregulated to, to give even more signaling. And in a wild type mouse, if we look at the subfornical organ, this is a coronal section, we see, again, the purple staining shows that it's leaky vasculature. The surrounding area uh, has tight vasculature. I say this, this green at the top is just an artifact of nonspecific sticking to myelin. But here we see that left one is in the nuclei of the normal CNS vasculature. It's absent from the nuclei of the subfornical organs vasculature. But now if we play the same trick and stabilize beta-catenin in all vasculature, we see that uh, not only has the purple marker gone away, the PLVAP, to be replaced by cloud and five in the subfornical organs vasculature, but now left one is also expressed and accumulates in those vascular endothelial cells. So a, a toggle switch here in which uh, canonical wind signaling toggles the cell back and forth between uh, leaky if beta-catenin signaling is suppressed and barrier competent if beta-catenin signaling uh, is turned on. Just to give you an idea how incredibly specific this is, this is a flat mount uh, looking down on the uh, dorsal brainstem, just we've peeled away the cerebellum. We're looking down at the area postrema and we're looking at its vasculature and staining for PLVAP in green. Uh, now, I'm sorry, I switched the colors on you. So uh, th this was potentially confusing, but the green is the leaky vasculature and the red with GLUT1 is the normal CNS barrier competent vasculature. And you can see that the vasculature that, that, that supplies the area postrema in green is uh, uniformly leaky. What's amazing is the uh, sharpness of the boundary between the two. Uh, going from one vascular endothelial cell to its immediate neighbor, we go from green to red. There's no gradation in between. That is that the, state is the states are quantized. A cell is either completely leaky or completely tight. And uh, it seems probably thanks to various positive feedback loops that there's no in between. And here I'll just note, we've, we've been wondering what the source of this difference in gene expression and of course cell biological properties is. And so we've looked at uh, known proteins that extracellular proteins that inhibit Wnt signaling. You might expect that some of them would be in these, uh, these regions, these uh, circumventricular organs, and in this case, the area postrema, now shown in a coronal section. And in fact, here's one of them. It's called WIF1, Wnt inhibitory factor one. We actually discovered this about 25 years ago. It's a secreted protein that binds tightly to essentially all Wnts and serves as a competitive inhibitor. And you can see by in situ hybridization, it's precisely expressed in the area postrema, not in the adjacent brainstem or the cerebellum. And when we knock that out, what we see is a partial conversion. I emphasize partial because there are clearly other players here and I don't wanna overstate this, but if we look at an area postrema in a wild type, WIF1++, we see here uh, in purple, the uh, cells that are in the area postrema and that are uh, leaky. Um, and then we can ask how many of those cells have GLUT1, they're, they're very few. But if we do the same uh, analysis in a WIF1 knockout, we see quite a few more cells and we've quantified this and it's highly statistically significant. But I think what this is doing is it's pushing the toggle switch a little bit, but there are other players for sure, which must be critical for pushing it the rest of the way. And we don't know at this point what those players are. So let me just conclude by saying that our approach, our current approach is really to take a deep dive at the uh, whole genome uh, analysis of, of uh, barrier competence and uh, the gene expression program that's underlying the CNS vascular endothelial cell phenotype. 
And so we've done, for example, um, RNA-seq, and here's just a comparison of mouse, brain, liver, lung, and kidney. These are facts purified endothelial cells. R1 and R2 are the two replicates in each case. So for this particular instance, this is the glutamate, trans, uh, the glutamate transport for GLUT1. Uh, we can see that there are lots of transcripts in the brain endothelial cells. If we look at accessible chromatin with ATAC, we see multiple regions upstream that are accessible. The promoter region is largely accessible in all cell types, even though it's not expressed in the non-CNS cell types. But these upstream accessible regions are presumably enhancers. And in fact, when we look at uh, methyl cytosine, and this is done in collaboration with Joe Ecker's lab at the Salk, uh, whole genome methylome analysis, we see that in the brain, there are clear regions of hypomethylation that correspond exactly to the regions of chromatin accessibility. You can see them here in, in each of these places, as well as the gene body being less methylated because it's expressed. So uh, with this in hand, Mark Sabah has done a very uh, thorough computational analysis. We have a pretty good idea based on the uh, putative transcription factor binding sites within the promoters and enhancers, which transcription factors are relevant to the CNS blood-brain barrier phenotype and, and distinguish it from the non-CNS cells. And so we hope uh, at some point this will, just to circle back, give some clinical dividend. I think uh, the big question from the clinical point of view is what's different about these cells in the disease condition and what can we do about it? So thank you very much. I'll stop there and I look forward to questions and to meeting many of you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.